about creating content for students and alumni and friends of the Belisario College of Communications. My name is Pam Hervey. I'm a 1994 graduate of journalism and the current president of the Belisario Alumni Society Board. I'm also a producer of content myself and own a small production company in Richmond, Virginia, where I create broadcasts and digital content for agencies and corporations, nonprofits, and more recently, public television. I am joined today by two fantastic Penn Staters, Rob King and Mark Lima, who are not only incredibly accomplished in their careers in news and documentary content, but are dedicated supporters in a variety of ways of the students and alumni of the Belisario College, and we can't thank them enough. Rob is the current senior vice president and editor at large at ESPN, and Mark is the West Coast bureau chief for CBS News. So before we dig in and have a conversation, I want to let everybody who's watching know that the chat function is active and available for your questions. I will moderate those questions as best as I can while we talk. Um, and if your question has something to do with what we're talking about in the moment, then I will certainly um, throw it out at that time. But otherwise, we will have some time at the end um, for a dedicated question and answer session. And I certainly hope to be able to get to all of your <coughs> questions and we'll do the best that I can. So just, just really to start off, I have a few questions myself for these guys. And what I enjoy most about doing uh, these things are, it, it, is that I learn something from, from those that I get a chance to talk to. So I am thoroughly looking forward to having this conversation with the two of you tonight. Um, and let's start with Mark, if we could start with you, why don't you talk a little bit about your path from Penn State? Sure, well, you know, in, in a lot of ways, obviously my path started with Penn State and it started with an internship um, that I had the summer before graduation in uh, Richmond, Virginia at the ABC affiliate there. Uh, that led to them hiring me as a news photographer. So I got my start as a, as a TV news photographer, but pretty quickly they asked me if I could be the number three sports guy. And I thought, I don't know, I'm a news guy, but it sounded pretty good. So I would, I shot, I went to sporting events every weekend. I did some on-air reporting, and when nobody uh, wanted to anchor on holidays, I, you know, I put on a tie and, and anchored on Christmas Eve. Um, but I learned a lot there. I ran a microwave truck. I edited it. I, I kind of did everything. And the one thing I came out of it knowing was that I didn't want to be on television. And really, what I thought I wanted to do was be a producer. And so, as luck would have it, my my news director at the time took a new job. Uh, at a startup cable news outlet in Washington, D.C., and he hired me to be a sports producer. So that was my kind of first producing job. I worked there for a few years. I went to the ABC affiliate uh, as a sports producer in, in Washington. And then um, four years later, um, I went to ABC News in, in uh, New York as their director of affiliate services for sports. And that was a great gig. I mean, I I went to the Super Bowl and the Final Four every year. I went to a couple Olympics. I worked really closely with ESPN on a lot of projects. Um, it was a great gig, but I pretty quickly realized that I worked for ABC News and I kind of had hit my ceiling in sports there. So I was fortunate enough that they offered me the job of deputy bureau chief in Los Angeles. Um, and so that was like slide over back into the news world. And it was really a great gig. I loved Los Angeles. Um, my first big thing was covering the Michael Jackson trial out here. Um, we had wildfires, we had floods and mudslides. You know, the West is just a chock full of great stories and, and, and news events. So that was a real learning experience. And I worked for all the programs across ABC News. After four years there, I go back to New York uh, to work as a senior producer at Nightline, a show I loved, kind of longer form content, um, really talented correspondents and producers, and you really had a lot of leeway to tell a story in a more full, fuller sense than you did at 6.30 every night. So, so that was great. Um, during that time, I covered the Sandusky story, so ABC News knew I was a Penn Stater, and they sent me there to run our coverage um, of Sandusky. I also ended up, ABC News allowed me to work on a, a, a documentary there, Happy Valley, which um, was pr uh, executive produced by a guy I went to high school with. I grew up in State College. So that was a tough story. Um, I was sleeping in my parents' uh, 
house every night, you know, the bedroom I grew up in and then covering this terrible story during the day. So that was a real challenging time. Um, and then a year or two later, ABC asked me if I wanted to work on this joint venture they were exploring with Univision. It was going to be a new network to um, uh, appeal to millennial uh, Latinos, uh, English dominant. And that was great. Like, who gets to, you know, I was a front row seat to, to build a network from the ground up, you know, literally. The, the first time I was in the building, you know, there were front end loaders in there and they're moving stuff. And, you know, we built a network, we hired 200 people, including five Penn Staters. Um, and, you know, it was a really, really um, amazing opportunity to get to be a part of that. Um, we did some really great content, did some crazy content. Um, <laughs> the management of the place wasn't always maybe what it could have been. Um, and the network didn't succeed in the way maybe some of us had hoped it would, but it was a great chance. I got to do so many different things, creating documentaries and you know, World Cup coverage. I did an animated uh, half hour Christmas special, like you know, who gets to do that? That was a pretty cool thing. Um, a couple of years in there, Jorge Ramos asked me to run his uh, English language um, content including a new project with Facebook. So we put up a show called uh, Real America on Facebook Watch. It was, uh, it was a vertical show. So we shot everything, you know, everything aired vertically. It was meant for your cell phone. Um, and it was really fun. Great editorial opportunities. We won some nice awards, all that kind of stuff. But what was really interesting was it was an insight into we brought in a lot of revenue for Univision. So it's it's nice to be a profit center <laughs> and a, a news gatherer, right? So you're not just sending money out, you're actually bringing some in. And that was greatly appreciated. So that was a real learning experience. And then over the summer, you know, working from home during a pandemic in, I don't know, June or July, I get a call from CBS and they say, Hey, do you have any, you know, we have an opening in LA for a bureau chief. Do you have any interest? I didn't have a resume. I didn't have anything together. I wasn't looking for a job, but you know, in the end, it, it was a great opportunity. I, I'm really happy I took it. I'm talking to you from Los Angeles now. Um, and it's, uh, so kind of that's my path. I would say the one thing I'm really fortunate to have is a family who's been accepting of moving back and forth across the country, north and south, east and west. Um, they're in Miami still. We're working that part of this out, but, um, but I'm grateful to them for kind of sticking with me through all this. And I think one of the, one of the important things too, and what we were talking about before we kind of went live here is that everybody's path from Penn State is circuitous, right? There's like, go, we go a lot of different ways. And no way is the right way. It just as long as you're learning along the way and you're able to build upon it um, and get to where you want to be, that's all that matters. So, um, uh, Rob, how about you start? What's your path from Penn State? Well, I mean, like the first thing I would say is that listening to Mark is just so inspiring. And I hope everybody who's on the call who are not showing your faces, by the way, which is <laughs> highly disappointing. Like. Like, I just want to be with Penn State people who are like in this conversation. You've already given up. There you go. You've already given up your like Tuesday night and like you're paying attention to this, like show your faces because we're here in this moment. But Mark's, um, Mark's story is really, really inspiring. He said a bunch of things that are really, really important for people in this call. The first thing is at that moment that you're involved with State College, Happy Valley, like, you know, committed to being in this general conversation around communications or journalism, you know, you've made a commitment, right? But you don't know where that's gonna take you. Uh, like I graduated as an English major from Wesleyan University in Connecticut, came to Penn State after I'd been in the working world for a year at the Washington Post, where I'd already made the decision that I was gonna be the first black editorial cartoonist in the country. That was my whole path. It has nothing to do with what I do for a living right now, zero. But when I was 22 and I had the gift of certainty, that's what I actually thought I was heading towards. So I worked as a assorted mail at the Washington Post for a year. I sold cartoons while I was there. I got a university fellowship based on the cartoons that I did as a 
graduate now in my first job sorting mail at the Washington Post. Penn State was thinking broad enough to say, this is an interesting thing. Let's bring this person on campus. Let's give him an opportunity. And so I came to campus, immediately connected with the Collegian. If you're working for the Collegian, raise your hands right now because I want to see you and I want to give you honor because like that is a jam right there. So I joined the, the folks at the Collegian as a graduate student. Uh, university fellowship, I didn't have to teach. I just had to study. Uh, I was there for one year. So I'm like really a Penn State poser. Like I've only, I only had like one full year of the experience. In fact, I'm such a poser that like first home game of the season, I was going to play golf and I was walking the opposite direction of everybody who was walking towards Beaver Stadium. And I went to a little division three school. I had never had that experience of a hundred thousand people dressed in blue and white going the opposite direction to me. So I got my education really early. Um, yeah, so I, you know, um, I, I interviewed when like these companies came on campus. I said yes to the first job that said yes to being a cartoonist. I didn't pay attention to the small print. I urge you to pay attention to the small print because I got a job in the middle of nowhere in Illinois as an editorial cartoonist, but also as a general assignment reporter and a graphic artist. And this was like 1986. And friends, let me tell you, when I walked into that newsroom to start working as, an, as a graphic artist an editorial cartoonist and a general assignment reporter, the first thing I had to do was blow ashes off of the Macintosh computer because in 1986, in this little newsroom, they didn't even use Macs. They didn't know what a Mac was. And there was a fire three weeks before I started. And they grabbed all the essential stuff and ran out of the building. And they left the Mac in the building. So when I started work to draw maps and charts, I had to blow ashes off the computer because it was, it was that bad. I'd blow ashes off of the, the manual. I don't want to take a ton of time talking about my journey. It's pretty easy to kind of find me online. I will say... I was an early adopter into digital design, early adopter into digital photography. I was a cartoonist for a number of years. I had a comic strip for six years. And then uh, in 1997, I made the decision that like, or 1998, I made the decision that if I was ever gonna run a newsroom, I had to leave visual journalism. I had to leave design. I had to leave graphics. I had to leave cartooning behind and get involved in the assigning reporters, the working with reporters. And I'd gotten this job through a course of a series of jobs at the Philadelphia Inquirer, where I was for seven years. And um, a year into taking a job at the Inquirer after, and you could look at my path, after a whole series of jobs where I was running divisions and running at smaller newspapers, they said, we want you to run something. Here's your choice, business editor or deputy sports editor. And I knew sports, I was a division three athlete, and I was like, okay, I'll do that. Um, by the way, my closest friends at the Collegian were all in the sports department. They're all, we're, you know, we were all idiots together in 1986 when we went to the Orange Bowl. Like that, the, 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 those are my people. So I said, yeah, deputy sports editor. And um, a story I will tell is my first day on the job, I went to a food truck at 15th and Calla Hill in Philadelphia. I was standing in line and somebody walked up behind me. I could hear the feet come up, Robert King. Stephen A. Smith, do you know that I am the lowest paid NBA beat writer at a major metropolitan newspaper in the United States of America? That is how we met. So I've known Stephen since 1998. Um, it wasn't until 2004 that I ended up leaving newspapers to join ESPN. And in between, I stayed at newspapers for a long time for a no number of reasons. Number one, in 2000, I wanted to cover a national political convention, the Republicans of Philadelphia, I wanted to cover Olympics. The Olympics were in Sydney. I had a bunch of opportunities at the Philadelphia Inquirer and I left as deputy managing editor. I ended up coming to ESPN in large part because it was uh, not because of what was happening with newspapers, but because I'd said no to ESPN like three times. The first time because the job offer was parallel to the one I had. The second time we were trying to start a family, it was complicated. The third time my son was born, he was on my lap. But I was like, oh, I think I was supposed to go to an interview. Um, but I finally joined ESPN in 2004, and I've had a host of opportunities that have been fantastic, whether it's been, you know, uh, running outside the lines, our, our journalistic program, whether it's Rob Michaels on the, on the call, like, you know, being involved in studio production writ large. Um, I ran Sports Center for three and a half years. I had two stints overseeing our digital transformation. Um, 
now in my job as editor at large, I get involved in very big, big projects. So very fortunate to be an executive producer on The Last Dance. Very, very fortunate to be executive producer of the ESPYs. Um, you know, we had a series of films that ran this summer because there were no sports. Lance Armstrong, Bruce Lee, Sosa McGuire. You know, very fortunate to work on those projects. Working right now with Colin Kaepernick uh, on his story. Um, and really responsible for all of our editorial direction. And if I can make this make sense for any of you, I will say this. I'm in this job now because I learned both as an undergrad and at Penn State, the value of storytelling, but also the value of listening to each other, right? I'm in the empathy business. I want you to do two things. I want you to feel like what we do is useful to you. And I want you to feel like what we do is amazing to you. And so, uh, you know, I actually want you to think about all the ways in which you currently consume information, whether you're on Clubhouse or whether you're on TikTok or what, you know, you're constantly amazed and it's constantly of use to you. And so if nothing else, I would just tell you that like, while my path makes about as much sense as this old comic strip, uh, The Family Circus, where little Jeffy goes on a walk and he walks all over the neighborhood, like that's my career path. I want to give you the gift of believing that you can do that. You can make those kinds of choices and expect good things to happen because that's the truth. So long as you stay open and so long as you're a constant learner and so long as you stay true to like the beauty of storytelling, which is about wonder and surprise. Thanks, Rob. So I think, and, and that is kind of a really great trans transition because this really is, uh, this, this whole series that we've created, um, the five part series has really been about storytelling and storytelling in a different, in, in two different audiences really. And, and the, in particularly we are, it could be, you know, it could be broadcast, it could be print, it could be digital, it could be audio. Um, it could be, you know, I mean, however, it could be a social media stream of some sort. That's the kind of content and creating content and telling stories in those, with those channels that we're talking about. Um, this one in particular is about really news, news feature, document long form storytelling. And, and, and so what I wanna do is I wanna kind of, um, you know, talk with Mark a little bit first about, and then again, you guys, the chat function is open so you can start, you know, putting in your, um, your questions. I will say, Rob, that was like, I, I almost thought that there would be music in the background when you told everybody to turn their, to turn their cameras on because it was suddenly this animation that was happening on my screen. <laughs> um, but well Mark, done. yeah, well done. Uh, Mark, you have, and you know, you've already just really just kind of told your story and you've been in the business for over 30 years, the news, the news business in one way or the other. Um, how has the news industries changed into this more innovative storytelling as opposed to the who, what, where, when traditional storytelling. Um, that still happens and still is necessary, but yeah. we're, we're kind of going outside of that. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think what you were just talking about and, and, and Rob too, you know, we have so many opportunities now to tell our stories in so many different ways. You know, my daughter in college, right, is a storyteller whether it's on her Instagram or her Twitter feed, right? You guys are all storytellers because you're, you have these, this ability, whether you're a journalist or not, to kind of be recording and telling your story every day. And some of us, um, some of us try to really focus on some of those different things, avenues, but it's, it's, it's actually, and <laughs> there's a lot of troubling things in the industry, but as for the ability to tell stories right now, we have so many different ways to do it. And I, I talked about, you know, videos for your phone. Uh, you know, what a cool step away that was for me to, you know, a guy who was a 16 by nine, I just wanted everything in HD 4K, give me the, you know, all of a sudden now I had to make stuff for a, a vertical format. That was such a new challenge. It was fun, it was exciting. Everybody in our team was excited by it. Um, and I think those opportunities exist and, and you, you, you can monetize them too, right? So YouTube or TikTok, um, Facebook, right? They, they all, there's just, a, there's a lot of ways um, to, uh, to get your story told and you can start doing it today, right? Everybody has their, everybody's doing it every day. So I think that's the, the thing is you're not limited to the six and 11 o'clock news anymore, right? That's really 
we're getting it all day, every day. Right. And it's all, you know, it, it's, and, and that kind of is a little, has become dicier a little bit because we have, you know, we've all heard the stories about what's fake and what's not and, and, and where people are getting their news is a whole nother situation. You know, I mean, you could ask anybody who's any of, of, of us who are on this call, where's the first thing you go? I mean, I go to CNN, but some people go to Twitter, you know, I mean, so, um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on, the whole fake news story and whether or not, you know, how do you, how are you combating that with your organization? It's, I mean, it's a battle and, you know, we talk about it a lot and it's hard because we had a conversation today. I'll just share you with about climate change. We have a big group. We're in a consortium about climate change. And so we're trying to figure out a, you know, how do we get climate change stories actually on the news every day? which can be a challenge in this news cycle, right? To step away and do like a two minute piece at 6.30 on climate change. Um, but, but something that came up was that, you know, everything has been so politicized now, you know, the, that, that even, you know, the Green New Deal originally 70 to 80% of all Americans were in favor of it when it was very first put out. Then you had, it became this politicized term, uh, some of the right wing media started to, to talk about it in a negative way. And that number really shrank in hopes of it for debt. And, and so nobody will use the term anymore. So I think, I don't know what the answer is, except that the answer for us and to, and I think for you guys is to tell authentic stories that are factually correct, you know, based, based on facts, based on what you see and what you know and what you've researched. Um, and stick to that. And, you know, don't be cowed by, you know, hopefully, <clears throat> uh, hopefully things will move in a different direction. But we've, you know, we, I think our first responsibility is to, is to, is to be true to that ourselves and to make sure that we're doing everything we can to tell the story. And if we make a mistake, admit to it um, and, and tell people why we made that mistake, you know, be, be truthful, be transparent. I think in the same, uh, you know, kind of my, my, my next question really is to the same way is that we, you know, um, we used to not be a part of the story, right? Like that's like journalism 101 is don't be part of the story. And yet there are so many shows on TV right now with the weekly on FX or the circus on Showtime that's really about showing that process of how they get the story and the drama that it, you know, that, that might entail. Um, you know, how, tell me a little bit about, cause you did a show like this at Fusion yeah. uh, called The Naked Truth. And that was sort of behind the scenes of your reporters. Talk a little bit about what that balance was like to, to really get the story, but also make it entertaining. Well, the journalism, the research is always really, really important in that stuff, right? So that's got to come first. It was always, it was a lot of fun to figure out how to tell the story and to let the audience in on, on, on seeing a little bit about how you went about it, whether it was showing people the meetings or just having the camera that's stepped back a little bit, that's showing the interview in a different way, right? There's all kinds of ways. We've all seen it now. Um, but I do think it helps connect our, we were really, that was all about transparency. We wanted people to know this is how we're doing what we're doing. And especially we were a, a network geared towards a younger audience. And so we wanted to give them the feeling that like, here's how this whole news thing works, you know? And, and you can see a little bit how we're making our decisions, who we're choosing to interview, how those things happen. Um, and, <clears throat> And as much as we did that, though, we try, you, you know, I'm a little leery of, you know, the reporter being the story, right? I still think the story itself is that there's, there's, that's the important thing is the story, the investigation, the, the thing you're after. Um, and that other stuff is kind of nice window dressing and it helps draw, if you do it well, it draws people in, I think it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a different format. And you see some of the shows you cited are really good at that. So uh, we have a question from Quinn um, for you is how, how do you feel storytelling and journalism, ha have they become less personal or more connected due to digitizing and social media? 
I think they're more personal. I think that, I think. I think it invites a two-way conversation. Yeah, right? yeah, much more. Um, and it also, you know, I think because you have all these formats, you can do something, you can do what's truer to you. And I think whether that's a podcast, right, where you can kind of just dive deep into your passion, the thing that you care about and love the most, and you can, you know, share that with everybody. That's a really personal thing. And it's, you know, it's, it can be real journalism. Um, uh, and I think you see the same thing on some of the other outlets, right? If you, you, you can tell a story in a way that, that, um, or a story that's really important to you, um, you have outlets to be able to find uh, find a home for that stuff now, I think, in a way that you never would have before. Rob, what do you think? Do you agree? So, you know, I've said on, I've been on record many times that I don't believe there's a mass audience anymore. There's a massive audience of individuals. And everybody's finding their own doorway into their experience with information. So, you know, I think that makes things much more complicated, not only from a content and storytelling perspective, but even from a product development perspective. I actually feel like, you know, um, one of the things we all recognize in the places where we purchase that we don't really recognize about places where we consume content is places where we purchase have completely reoriented themselves to your experience. They know what you've bought. They know what you're interested in. They know what you're likely to move on. They know the kinds of ads you're likely to click on. And they've actually created a whole economy out of knowing you. And so I do think that the challenge that Mark talks about is getting past the way in which we actually think about news gatherers and news uh, deliverers being the sole source of access and really recognizing the importance of understanding, you know, that you, you individuals are the most important point of access, that your curiosity that your routine during the day, that the devices through which you consume information are the most significant ways in which we have to think about how we do our work. Um, and, you know, um, there are a bunch of questions in here that are really smart about, you know, attention span or streaming or willingness to find information on other platforms. That's hard work for those of us who've actually grown up with this, this system of storytelling that's really about We've gone out, we found information, we're gonna present it to you in a way that's compelling. You're going to consume it and you're gonna consume it on our time and you're going to then do with it what you will, but, and then we will disappear from the conversation. We're not gonna be involved. And realistically, people on this call and people around the world are attaching themselves to influencers, attaching themselves to platforms that are there on demand. And, you know, I have a, I, three kids, I have too many kids, too stinky and anyone who wants a kid, let me know. But I, I got 16, 13 and 12. My observation of them is that, you know, they see influencers, they see their friends, they dip in and out of com conversations and story streams. It's a different model than, hey, the six o'clock sports center is on at six o'clock. Like I got it on over here because I'm 58 years old, but nobody else in this call is watching the six o'clock sports center. And that's a tough pill to swallow but that's reality. And so one of the things we have to think about is what are the component parts of the six o'clock sports center that are vital to our conversation? And how do we make sure that you, there's a way for you to find that we've actually done the work for you to be informed or your life to be improved by what we've done. It's, it's a complete change. And in a world in which we are so divided and our divisions are so clearly delineated, particularly over the last you know, four and a half years, we have to work harder than ever for people to find the access point to which they will care about the work we do. Yes, that's a very good point. It was something that I was going to bring up. It's like, you know, you can you can find the right uh, channel or the right tactic for whatever it is that you're going to um, create, but driving people to that channel or that tactic to watch can be um, just as difficult as creating it in the first place. So, um, Rob. But, a little bit about, uh, you know, sports. I used to, I also started in sports a long time ago um, and, and really love, really love that sports story, right? That sort of, that, you know, the, the agony of defeat, the thrill of victory um, kind of thing. It's kind of a, a, a uh, what, what is really your philosophy on telling sports stories right now? you know, um, where some sports stories are less about the sports and more about the personality involved. I mean, you, met, you mentioned, you know, Colin, Kaep Colin Kaepernick, whatever it is that you're working on right now. 
Um, what's your philosophy on, on telling those stories? I think the biggest challenge is to surprise people because there's so much information everywhere. You feel like you know everything. You feel like you know every headline. You feel like you've seen every highlight, you know, irrespective of whether you come to us or any other platform. You know, even, even if it's like a crazy play that happened in a sport you don't care about, it's going to show up on your, your Instagram or TikTok feed. So it's hard to surprise people. So from a storytelling perspective, we work really hard on having people leave or dismount with a sense of, I did not know that, right? And that's the challenge. When we sit there and make story pitches, it's kind of like, doesn't everybody kind of know that? And I'll, I'll be clear about it. Like, there are plenty of stories that just turn into tropes, right? He or she or they were sick, now they're healthy. He or she or they were deprived, now they're wealthy. He or she or they were uh, uh, healthy, now they're sick. You know, and like, you know, these stories, they show up and shows all the time. You're kind of like, I've kind of seen that, right? And there are some cases where it's really important to sort of drive home this narrative that there's a, an incredible human resiliency that we all share that sometimes we th see through sports. But a lot of times we do stuff that falls into cliche. And we're a different kind of, sports is a different kind of news in that most of what we cover sits on a calendar for anywhere from one to four years. Like nobody should be surprised, well, we'll be surprised at the Olympics for where they are because they're supposed to be last year. But when the Olympics start, nobody's gonna be surprised that the Olympics started, right? And NBC and others, ABC for years have created a whole sort of uh, franchise in surprising people by telling stories about athletes that they didn't know existed until the moment they were at the Olympics. So we spend a lot of time working like, how can we be surprising and delighting people in a world in which everything seems to be already laid out in front of them. And that can be done through visuals, that can be done through statistics, that can be done through long form documentary. Um, I mean, you know, everybody in the world thought they knew who Michael Jordan was, even the folks who hadn't seen him play. And we disproved that, you know, for, for five weeks, you know, double head, we surprised people constantly. And I remember like, as we saw cuts of that film, we were constantly pushing on you know, doesn't everybody already know this or what can we actually do to surprise people? And just a little, a little story, I will tell you, like I was sitting there, uh, first presentation I saw of any content, and this is like two and a half years ago, uh, first time the director Jason Ayer set with, set with uh, Michael Jordan. And it was the clip that didn't show up until episode nine where Michael broke down and said, if you don't wanna play with me, then don't play with me, right? That's the first thing we saw. And we were like, oh, we have a series here because no one has ever seen that guy look like that. No one's ever seen that before. And that actually was our guiding light. Like, how can we constantly surprise? That's been the guiding light of 30 for 30. But it's also the guiding light for Sports Center tonight. I mean, I will tell you that people, and again, Rob knows this. Rob's like been in the trenches doing a show, you know, that's a daily show. Like, you get down, you get on the whiteboard, you start writing topics, and you're like, what are we going to do that's going to make somebody go, huh, I didn't think of it that way, or I didn't know that. And again, again, it goes back to that point of empathy. It goes back to that point of surprise or delight. It's hard work. It's hard work because, you know, again, it's like these are genetically enhanced human beings. It's sort of like watching Marvel films. But like you have to do the work to figure out like how are we drawing the sense not only of their humanity, but how they're connected to us. And when you do that, when people say, I did not know that I could be sympathetic to this player or this moment, you know, Tom Brady gets into the Super Bowl for the 10th time, he runs to the sideline and all he wants to do is talk to his son, Jack, right? That's next level, right? That's where you're sort of like saying, it's not just that he's great. It's that he's got a son who's now old enough to travel with him to Green Bay. And the first thought he has is to ask an usher, I'm Tom Brady, may I talk to my son? And that is like, that's the work that we do on a regular basis. So uh, one of the questions that, that Professor Affleck has asked um, is, uh, <laughs> hey, John, um, you know, talking a little bit about how ESPN picks documentaries. And this was kind of a, uh, the documentary topics. And this was kind of a question that I also had for, for Mark. And I hope that Mark can answer this as well, not particularly about ESPN's process, but in general, you know, what what kind, and you, you may have talked a little bit about it too, Rob, when you talked about surprising people, right? What is that deeper story within the story sort of thing that would surprise people? But um, 
I mean, I think COVID and the pandemic and everybody being in lockdown and just sitting in front of Netflix or whatever um, has really brought people's interest back to um, watching things that are a little bit longer. And so I think um, I'm wondering what, what were some of the things that y'all talked about? Rob, you can start, you know, about, um, you know, what are some of the longer stories that we can tell? How do you choose those topics? What are the things that you concentrate on? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go fast because I really want to hear Mark's answer on this. I mean, the birth of 30 for 30 was a collection of people who decided that the sports documentary landed too much in the topic space and not enough in the story space and really felt like the answer to that was to find directors who are moved by stories they wanted to tell to pitch and kind of build a, a series of narratives that became 30 for 30. But they were really interested in this notion that, you know, um, what's that phrase we do in our, in our marketing, but um, what if I told you, right? It's like, you think you know the story, but you don't know the story. Um, and it was driven by people who were passionate about the stories they wanted to tell. Uh, that still informs what we do today, whether it's 30 for 30 films or podcasts or even ESPN films. Um, I think the answer to your question, and Mark might have a different answer about why people are more willing to spend more time with documentary. I mean, doc documentary moves anywhere from 35 minutes to multi-parts. By the way, the success of the OJ um, Main America film, now every pitch is like five parts and you kind of have to get to people like saying, hang on a second, what's the story? Ultimately, it lives with story. You know, we take pitches all the time. I mean, I we take pitches all week, all the time that are really more topic than story. And when you push on what story is and how you will drive the story, you get to a deeper answer of why it will matter to our audiences. Sports audiences only react in one of two ways. They either cheer or they boo. They don't say, oh, that's interesting and give a golf clap. They either lean all the way in or they lean all the way out. So in our world, it's really about, we win with story. What is the story you wanna tell? So for example, somebody might walk in and say, Michael Jordan, can't miss topic, right? But without the specifics of the story, and in that case, it really became how that season in 1998 was the beginning of the end, irrespective of all the previous success. Without that story, we're just gonna have a lot of great video that people would have watched with no sports on television, but it would not have had the resonance that it had. Mark? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's so funny, the this, this story versus topic. That was at when I was at Nightline, and those are, you know, we were doing, sometimes we do a full, 22 minute show on one topic, but most of the time it was like seven or eight minute pieces, almost little mini documentaries, but long form for kind of the daily news business. Um, and in pitch meetings, it was, that was always the thing. Where's the story? You're just giving me a topic and there's lots of great topics out there, right? That, but unless you find um, the thread, the humanity, the heart that's in those, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate. And I mean, the, the other thing we said at Nightline was that it was such a different show because your, your, your competitor was sleep most of the time. So we knew that if you didn't start the piece with something that was going to pull people in, they were just turning off the TV and going to bed. So we had a very specific, like, you know, theory of the, uh, of the piece, which is, Man, hook me in that first in that first minute. You gotta you gotta drag me in there so that I can't, you know, I can't go to sleep. I gotta at least stay up through the next commercial break. Um, but I think it's yeah, it's 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 great storytelling and it's it's having a hook and heart. Mm. Yeah, definitely. What I always try and and tell people is if you know think about how you want that audience member to feel when they walk away from watching what you just put together. You know, if if they if they are, did they, do you want them to be moved? Do you want them to be mobilized to do something, you know, to join a cause, to do, you know, whatever? I mean, that's, then you're, you know, you're telling that story in the right way. If they just kind of turn off the, turn off whatever it is, or just kind of walk off and do something else, then you didn't really get to the part of the story that, that was important. And so, um, so yeah, that- I mean, Just to play off that, Pam, because it- Sure. I think there's a really important thing too that we often forget. I know, you know, it's thinking about the audience. 
it's it's putting yourself in the audience's position because you know we all get excited about the story we want to tell uh and maybe we have insider knowledge or we you know you got to put yourself in the position of the person who's going to watch it sometimes and say are they going to understand this are they going to you know like this person what are the, are they going to be confused at this part where we just kind of go off are they going to remember that we told the first part of the story earlier so you know really when you're whether you're writing or doing radio or 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 telling a video story think about who your audience is and how they're going to consume what you've put together and are they is it going to make sense to them are they going to be passionate about it are they going to share your passion about it are they going to advocate for you in some way or you know tell people to go watch it you know that sort of thing yeah for sure and audience was actually something part that i really wanted to talk about too and both of you give kind of um, spoken about how important it is to understand where your audience is, how they're consuming your content um, when, when really thinking about your story. Um, and so, but I definitely, because I have been told that I need to keep this to an hour and y'all have so many great questions. So what I really want to do, um, I do want to ask uh, Rob one, one more of my own questions, actually. Um, I have about four orders ahead, I would say. Okay. I'm sorry? No, about how long that would take. Oh, I, somebody's, somebody got on. So um, Rob, one more question that in what I always find interesting in sports is that, that, you know, some of the same events happen every year, right? Super Bowl, Olympics. How do you make that fresh? How do you, what, how are the, you know, what are the, some of the tips that you can tell these students? Because sometimes the students are covering these same stories too. So what do you, what do you go out there and look for um, to make the same event, the same sports event exciting? Well, the first thing you need to know about ESPN is we have bazillions of really talented, creative people who view everything as a new opportunity. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at the work we've done and really asking ourselves, how can we be better about it? And the reality is that every season is different. Every, every matchup is different. There's, if you work hard enough, you can find things that are going to make this all fresh and new. Um, and that's our job. I mean, again, as I said, like, you know, there's a Super Bowl most years. There's an Olympics every four years, most of the time. There's a Masters once a year, most of the time. Sometimes it's twice a year. Um, you know, this is all sort of pandemic related, but the reality is we got to be great every time these things roll around. You know, we got to be great as, as we see the schedule show up. We have to be great about ways in which to make people care because it just feels like it, otherwise it's just a cycle, right? Um, and so the the crazy thing about where we work is that we, we have people, I just don't know where they would work if they didn't work at ESPN. They love this. They think about it all the time. We challenge each other. Um, you know, we surprise each other. Uh, I can tell you right now, there's a vivid email trail going on around things we need to do around the Super Bowl. You know, it's a dream matchup between quarterbacks, but there's just such creativity going on right now about how we should be thinking about this. That is just refreshing, you know? Um, we're observing a really rough anniversary. Kobe Bryant was a friend of mine. Like I spent today looking at our texts. And yet, you know, we had a special on last night opposite an NFL game, but that has enriched coverage that we've done a year after losing Kobe. Uh, you know, we've, we've done exhaustive things about him without showing a second of crash photo. And somebody might say, well, like, you know, how'd you do that? Well, we thought about it. Right. We actually thought about it. We actually thought about what we wanted this anniversary to be and how and the voices which, with which we wanted to tell this story. Um, so it's our job. I mean, you know, we've been at this for, you know, 40 some years. Um, we have a culture that really drives trying to be great for our audience. And that also entails like not being stale for our audience. It entails letting people be part of the conversation about what we need to do to be better. So that's 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 how we get there. Awesome. All right, so let's get um, to some of these questions too. So uh, we had a question, Mark, and this may be a good question for you. How do you feel developing sources and sourcing has changed as your career has gone on? Uh, I I mean, on the one hand, I want to say sources have always been sources. It, it, it you know, I think it, it, it often depends on your hard work and your tact and your, your being where you need to be, making the relationships, um, and 
and, and working hard, uh, you know, to, to be an honest broker with people that you talk to and that they know that they can trust you. And I don't think that's changed. I do think there's, there's a way in which digital media and there are, there are just, there's so many more ways to source material. Um, and I don't know if this is exactly in line with that, but you know, look, sometimes it's, sometimes it's uh, direct messaging somebody on Twitter and, okay you know, starting to try and build a trusting relationship. I mean, that's the, the network booker's best friend right now is Twitter DMs, right? Because they see the video or they know the person who said they saw the thing, you know, and, and so, so I think that it's expanded your possibility of, of how to find and, and reach out to people. Um, but direct sourcing, you know, sources for those investigative pieces are usually something that's, um, you know, sometimes people come to us uh, kind of right away with an idea, but but more often it comes out of somebody who's hanging around the courthouse a lot or who has great relationships uh, at the Department of Justice or somewhere else, and you know has and people are willing to give them some feed them some information. I think what we we have seen a little bit over the last couple of years um, is is some of uh, particularly civil servants who are willing to to kind of hand over information that they think the, the public should know and maybe maybe didn't get the didn't didn't get the full story on great so um rob this may be a good question for you or really for both of you what is the best way a student can show their potential as a storyteller yeah so the first thing i would say is when, in 1986 when i wanted to be a cartoonist i had no shot at showing anybody what the work i was doing like there was no internet there was only snail mail. There was only, like I used to go to a building um, on campus, uh, the communication center, and I would get like a book that get published once a year that listed all the editors. Uh, it's called Editor and Publisher Yearbook. It was like a once a year publication that had a list of names who were on mastheads of newspapers. And think about that. It came out once a year. So like people that I applied to might not even be working at these places. So I had no shot at finding out whether what I was applying to was getting to anybody who could give me a job. I could also not look at their newspapers and determine whether I could craft my, my submissions, my samples to look like I knew what mattered as news in their, in their locations. You have a much easier path towards really getting into how to be in this space. The first thing you need to do is find a way to show people your work and get feedback. If you are a writer, use Medium, use any of these sites that allow for writers to publish. If you're a photographer, use Instagram, use any of these places that lean into the visual. If you're a musician, use SoundCloud. Get your stuff in the public domain, get feedback, respond to the feedback, get better. Like we're all trying to get better. We're all trying to piecemeal our way. If you write something and you publish it on a Penn State platform, tweet it out with a link and let people sort of respond, but use it to get better. A creator needs to be in the space where he, she, or they are creating, he, she, or they are getting feedback that they can actually work on and grow as an artist. That is the most, if you're a filmmaker, shoot stuff, cut it, put it on YouTube, take the darts and arrows, but take the things that tell you that you're great. Same with TikTok, but that's literally how we're finding creators. People who are brave enough to put their space in the place where they're getting feedback and they're, they're living off of it. And yeah. you have access. I'm sorry, you have access to technology. You have, you know, you have the ability to be in that space. It's incredibly important to take advantage of that opportunity. And sometimes it means certainly for recent graduates as well, who are really just hitting pavement and trying to find a job. Sometimes it means doing that stuff for free, you know, finding well, the good a, story. That's exactly right. I was gonna say yeah. that you gotta show that you're willing to do this without the permission of the paycheck, okay? You don't need the permission of a paycheck to care enough to do a podcast or to write a story or to write a book or to shoot a film. This has to be your passion, right? And then on the other side of it, if you're lucky enough to get paid for what you love, that's, that's bonus. But as far as I can tell, I'm waiting for other evidence, we only get to do this one time, right? We get, only get to do all of this one time. So you might as well fully invest in your opportunity while you're here to participate in what you see people doing all around you every time you lift your phone. I can't believe they drew that. I can't believe they made that. I can't believe that sounded like that. You're, you have permission to participate. 
And I will admit that the current documentary that I'm working on right now, I started without any funding because it was just such a good story that I needed to start it. And so I'm, I literally did the first two months of it for free. Nobody paid me to do it, but that allowed me to use to get funding for the rest of it so that I can finish it and so an audience can see it. So it's still happening even after you know so many years, you just gotta go for it if it's a good story. I wanna get to a couple of these other last questions here. Um, for one of the things too, and Mark, maybe you can talk about this before I get to the question that's on here for Rob about women in sports journalism, because I do feel, believe that that's an important question, is um, we, we talked briefly about podcasts, right? Or some of those other kinds of content that does not is not your traditional kinds of content, right? Your Facebook watch, um, but podcasts, uh, there are some special series that are more personality driven than, um, than actual topic driven, maybe, you know, um, you know, talk a little bit about how your organization or your past organizations have really kind of taken advantage of the, of those kinds of, um, content. Well, I mean, I think podcasts have become really important to all major news organizations. It's just, a, it's a, you know, I will say it's not my specialty, except I listen to them. I'm a voracious uh, listener, um, and I have been for a while. Um, and but they're lucrative, and they they help really create a bond with the audience. I think that I think a podcast relationship is one of the closest ones you get in journalism. It feels like like I know these people. I, I they're talking to me. There's a there's something about that experience that's different than even radio or you know other audible experiences. That's just it's it's interesting. Um, and it's so expansive, right? There's just you can find just about anything you want on there. And um, and so I think it's as a reflection of your network having, you know, in some of our correspondents here and our different television programs have podcasts. Uh, I think they're, and they're most effective though, when they are, you know, there's a lot of podcasts that just take the recording of the show and put it on there and call it a podcast. It's a recording of the show. It's not really, there's no, there's no back and forth there. There's no sense of the, the, the personal. Um, I think when things are personal there, uh, reflect your brand or your, your passions, um, then I think they're incredibly valuable. And, you know, just as, Another way, you know, we there. It's not just the the six thirty news in the morning show. You know, again, it's another example of like we're all finding different ways to kind of to find an audience. Um, and I think you can. I think you can really look at podcasts too, um, or any of this sort of digital series as a companion piece to something that's a little bit larger. Even you know, um, I the documentary that I was just talking about. One of the things that we uh, you know, as we were shooting it, we said, we, we really should do a, a podcast with this to, sh to, so that people could hear these conversations that were going on between it's a, it's an art based, uh, and it's about, uh, um, a couple of things that were happening in Richmond last year and, and, uh, uh, and art and how the artist community kind of rose up and, and did, um, that's kind of hard to explain. So I, I, I'm trying not to, but I will say that, What's what we decided to do with the podcast was we we also created digital series too, little small, you know, two minute social things to help promote the documentary that we're going to work on, but also did the podcast to help, you know, just tell the story in a different way. And I think that that's what some of those work, um, how they work really well. Rob, I would go just ahead. say that I think Mark hit on the most important word though, and it is really about intimacy. There are not a lot of access points to storytelling, right? And I saw a presentation with the New York Times at Digital Content Next uh, uh, Symposium a couple of years ago. They themselves were shocked that the reason the Daily worked is because it was the first place where readers of the New York Times could have an intimate experience with a New York Times storyteller. And so when we launched our version of the Daily, the reason we did it was not just to have great stories, but we wanted to find a way for our audience to feel as though they knew our reporters, that they followed their path in terms of telling the story and felt like there was an access point to ESPN that they had that went beyond what the story showed. So Mark, you hit it 100%. Intimacy is precious. There, We talk about this personalized experience with audiences. Anything that makes people feel as though what they're consuming is theirs is powerful. It's a huge opportunity for all of us. 
Okay, and so I really want to get to the question because everybody's asking me to get to the question about <laughs> Quinn's question about um, let me see, and I just went past it. Rob, you probably read it as a woman. Yeah, so this I get, is about I get concerned, yeah, about sports journalism and editing, and that I wouldn't be taken seriously. Do you have any sort of advice for women who want to go into the field involving sports? Well, this is the first the first thing I want to tell you is you belong. Don't let anybody tell you you don't belong. And there are advocates everywhere in our business who are prepared to fight like hell for you, all right? Now, this is the, this is the same thing that, that storytellers of all kinds of different backgrounds face when they feel as though there's an anomalous, largely male audience that is preconditioned to feeling as though anyone who does not sound, look, or believe like them does not belong in this space. But I will tell you that we owe it to each other to be relentless and fearless in this space because the way in which we consume sports, the way in which we view sports, the way in which we would report on sports and the way in which we would report stories to people who are like us who need to find a place, that is essential to the future of our business. That is essential to the future of our business. Now, I spend a lot of time fretting that women feel as though there are very specific avenues through which they can participate in sports, whether that's being a sideline reporter, whether that's being an anchor on a sports news show. But I will tell you in real time, we are blowing up some of those stereotypes. Mina Kimes did not walk in this door just to be a sideline reporter. She uses data to define success in the NFL she has led the creation of our podcast. She writes long form stories that explain to people how athletes are in fact human. And she is a leader in our industry. And there is nothing that is gonna stop her from succeeding. I spent 10 years trying to make sure that Jamel Hill succeeded at ESPN. And the reality of our society is that she is now more formidable. It's almost like Obi-Wan Kenobi. She's more formidable in the aftermath of having spent time at ESPN but also because of having spent time at ESPN than ever before. These are hard lessons to learn in real time. But my colleagues who are women, I'm gonna tell you right now, you have to be relentless and you have to find those of us who are committed to being relentless for you. The Me Too movement of several years ago paired with the racial reckoning of this past summer have opened doorways for a lot of us. And they remind all of us that we stand on the shoulders of folks who've passed through. And even now, there are folks learning hard lessons in real time about language they've used or stories they've written. And we are all works in progress. But I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna urge you that my social feed is full of women who've passed through the doors of, of Penn State women who I've helped recruit to ESPN, who helped define ESPNW and then raged past ESPNW to help define ESPN. And we are in the realm of the possible right now. We are in the realm of the possible right now. If you feel as though every time there's a Twitter storm about somebody who acted badly, that is a stake in our heart, forget that. John Affleck introduced me to the awesome chapter at Penn State. And while I've been a member of Awesome for the last 10 years, I only really realized what the word meant when I sat at Penn State, because now I see women who are in the working world who spent time at the Penn State chapter of Awesome. And I know that this is a university that is creating our leaders of the future. Do not be daunted by Twitter memes. Do not be daunted by the headlines of today. I'm on a screen right now, but I'm telling you right now, I'm not there's nothing I'm more passionate about. My name's Rob King, it's not Robert Luther King, but I will tell anybody who's gonna tell stories from any dimension of diversity that I'm here to fight for you. It's the only reason that I've decided to stay in sports for 16 years. I've got plenty of opportunities to do other stuff, but this is the work. And so for those of you who are willing to go on LinkedIn and find me and talk offline, find me, I'll be right there. Here, here. Yep, thank you, Rob, that was great. So let's just kind of wrap this up a little bit. And, and is there any really last thoughts that uh, Mark that you may have on how kids can, how these students can get 
started, if they, you know, um, in, in being storytellers and creating content, what are your thoughts? Just, you know, look, view, we, I said it before, view your social feeds as your, you know, they are your kind of ongoing resume. You're creating it every day. Uh, curate it, make it great, make everything you put out there good and representative, be creative and be passionate. And, you know, I hired somebody not too long ago because she made these great hand-drawn um, explainers and she posted them on YouTube and she just happened to be a, a computer programmer. She had never worked in television before, but it, it was so good. Like we figured out a way to work her into the, into the job. You know, people appreciate good quality work um, and you know, you can make that and you're at a great place to connect with, with your professors, um, you know, with your internships and, and, and hopefully with alums, right? I'll, I offer the same thing, reach out on LinkedIn. I'm not a big LinkedIn guy, but I will respond and, and, uh, and help in any way I can. Go ahead, Rob. Well, first of all, I just wanna say like, you guys need to really dig into what Mark Lima has done because he's, he's the real deal. And, um, you know, no, don't shake your head. Don't do that. It's a guy who's doing the craft. So he's a big goddamn deal and you guys should pay attention. Um, the only thing I would offer is like, you know, we've, we've laid out for you a big, bold path. Well, I'm 58 years old and I'm telling you right now, be the age you are, okay? It's Tuesday night and you've spent an hour listening to a couple of older folks talk about this craft because you care about it, right? Two nights from now, it's gonna be Thursday night. I do not want you doing this on Thursday night. I want you to be your age on a Thursday night. I know the pandemic has changed what that means. I also want you to give yourself a break as you try to figure out what your next step is gonna be. The best advice I ever got, and John's heard me say this to many people, I'm gonna say it to you. It's gonna work out, you just don't know how yet. In 1986, I would have told you, I'm gonna be an editorial cartoonist and that's the only thing I'm gonna be has nothing to do with what I'm doing, what I'm doing right now. I'll say that again. It's gonna work out. You just don't know how yet, and that's okay. So while you're processing these big thoughts we laid on you, do yourself the honor of being the age you are. Because if you look at those of us who are not your age, every single one of us know exactly what I mean when I say, we would love to be where you are in the realm of possibility. You're in the realm of possibility. All right, so take everything we said, sort of own it however you can. But on Thursday night, I wanna make sure that you're all being your age and living your best life because you don't get to do that all the time. Well, I, I Rob King should just talk to me every night because you're <laughs> so inspirational for all of us. And I thank you both very, very much for joining me and talking about content and talking about um, the future and talking about, um, you know, what these students can do to, um, to get started on their storytelling path. So um, I want to remind everybody that this has been recorded. Uh, and so if you did miss the beginning or if any of your friends missed it, it will be on the Belisario website um, and you can send them there. Um, the next one in our series is on February 2nd at the same time, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it's concentration is about corporate communication. So if you or any of your friends have any um, interest in going into the corporate world uh, and using your storytelling skills there, um, that's definitely the virtual um, series that you want to attend. There will be uh, three other ones past that point that all have different categories, network television, public television, um, social media, digital journalism. So you're going to want to check out that website. So thank you both, Rob, Mark. Great thank to you. see you. Thank um, you all. Thanks for the conversation. Um, thanks for listening and um, stay safe and be well, everybody. Take care. Great seeing everybody. That was terrific. Great seeing you all. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for turning on your cameras. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.